Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week our guest is one of the great polling experts and a founding partner of GBAO Strategies, Jim Gerstein. Now remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the link to our sponsor, Miracle Made, in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. So please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. James, uh, we did this podcast a week ago. Donald Trump and his high command were riding high, measuring the White House drapes. 79 hours later, it all changed, and they were caught off guard. Trump is furious in public and I'm sure crazier than ever in private. As Joe Biden's withdrawal and Kamala Harris's ascent put Democrats in the ballgame, at least. Uh, and it was it, it, these were advantages they didn't have before. And, uh, you know, I think it's just driving the Republicans crazy. I'm kind of surprised they were so ill prepared. Uh, ch- challenges are ahead are huge. House Republicans under the direction from their commander uh, are already wildly claiming everything from this was a coup. To she's really not uh, an American. You know, you always want to recycle the old birther uh, charge. Uh, she has no right to Biden's campaign money. Uh, all, you know, insane. They're going to attack Harris on immigration, the Biden record. Her record as California prosecutor. You know, that's legitimate, even if some of it's inaccurate. But the dominant case they're going to make, I have no doubt, will be race, playing to fears and bigotry. Trump campaign co-chair, Chris Lasavita directed the swift boat attacks uh, against Vietnam veteran John Kerry in 2004. John McCain said those attacks were dishonest and dishonorable. You imagine what he's going to be able to do with the race card. And you already have small fry congressmen like Chip Roy and Tim Burchett saying she's the DEI candidate, diversity That's a dog whistle for race. You know, whether she was your first choice back in 2019 or 20 uh, or even now, uh, she really wasn't mine. Uh, But she got ahead not by DEI. She got ahead by winning elections. Two, as district attorney with a larger population than those congressmen's district. Two, as a state attorney general. One, as a United States senator and as vice president. All in electorates with with a relatively small black population. So Republicans who thought they had this race in the bag are going to start very soon a smear campaign that's going to make Willie Horton look like a parish priest, because that's what they do, James. Well, you know, Mike Tyson, who I think has endorsed Trump, but I don't care. The Iron Mike said one of the truest things ever. Everybody got a plan to get hit in the mouth, all right? And they got hit in the mouth, plain and simple. And... the, they being the Trump yes, people. Yes, they were hit in the mouth, and whatever plan they had is gone. And the initial reaction from uh, Jason Miller, who is Trump's chief policy advisor, and Sean Hannity, who his number one media, I don't know, lapdog supporter, whatever you want to call him, was the same. I'm serious. Vice President Harris wants to ban plastic straws. That's that was the initial. No, that was really? the initial. Oh, ye, oh I, yes. I, let me tell oh you. I told you when Ira Hayes was going up Mount Sarabachi, all he was thinking about is, God damn it, I want to drink in a plastic straw. Doris Miller, Admiral Shabitis' hero at Pearl Harbor, was shooting down Japanese heroes, thinking about fucking plastic straws. Oh, my God. I mean, you huh? can't. You, you, sometimes you, you got to see these people. And, of course, the latest thing is she slept her way to the top because it's in their world, it's no woman could possibly get anywhere without sleeping with someone. I mean, that's the only way to, to get ahead. And, and all of this shit is coming. You know it's coming. And you, you just have to... 
expose it for just how ridiculous the whole thing is. And it like Willie Brown is. Who would, I mean, I know Willie. I talked to him last fall. He's like a friend of mine. Do you think people in the fucking shopping mall or been, you know, at Walgreens are sitting around talking about Willie Brown? <laughs> He's a basketball player. She dated Willie Brown apparently a couple times when she was a single woman 25 years ago. God damn, is that a scandal? Oh, my God. Uh, I mean, huh? I, it just, but, but again, we know Willie. We know who he is. But who, who else? Willie's 91 years old now. Hey, the character's is a great guy. He's from actually East Texas. But it's, they, they can't help themselves. That's what you have to understand. They, 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 and of course, everybody. So it's always I, how many black children does Bill Clinton have? Jesus Christ, they're all over the world. Uh, I, I mean, it, Barack Obama wasn't even born right, in the country. Right, you right. Know. It, it's they, that's who they are, and they'll never be anything else but who they are. And and they, they're such who they are that now. They're attacking, and you can't see a picture of J.D. Vance's wife because you built a house based on racism, and now that you built it, it's falling down on you. So go ahead and try to get a picture of uh, uh, J.D. Vance's wife, who, by the way, clerked for two Supreme Court justices. I don't know, went to Yale and Paul. Or some, you know, it would be obviously it's a brilliant person. And by all rights, she's a nice person. I, 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 presumably, but you ain't going to ever see her. But you're right. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're, um, you're never going to see this lady. You, you know, James, I'm not surprised by, you know, the cheap politicians and certainly anything Trump does. You, you know, but I, I tell you, when, when I read, I guess it was today, the New York Times, Brett Stevens, who I just he's a conservative, I disagree with, but he's usually, you know, smart on policy, not that attuned politically. He played the race card and questioning her qualifications. You know, the DEI card, it's just such bullshit. He even reached back more than 30 years and said she flunked the bar exam the first time. Oh my God, that shows she's unqualified. I mean, Richard Nixon aced the bar exam and finished third in his class in Duke Law School and FDR flunked it the first time. So, Mr. Stevens, that really tells you a lot about leadership, doesn't it? It's going to be a smear campaign that's going to be unbelievable, James. But let's return to your subject that you brought up, uh, J.D. Vance. Uh, I just can imagine the rants at Mar-a-Lago now. Why the hell did my idiot son convince me to pick him? How am I going to blast immigrants, as you say, you know, with his wife? And Vance is going to go down as a mistake. Uh, he, he came out this week that back in 2016, James, among the other things he said, he speculated on how many women Trump assaulted. Now, you've kept track of this, and I'd love to see a colloquy between James Carville and J.D. Vance on how many women uh, Trump has assaulted. And, and the final point I would make, it for those who think he's just this really smart guy in national security, read Walter Pincus' column in the cipher, and you will see uh, how ignorant J.D. Vance is about a number of national defense issues. Well, I don't know where, where, do, I, where do I start. First, uh, Trump's spouse and J.D. Vance's spouse come from both immigrants. Okay? <laughs> Without immigration, they, wouldn't, they couldn't even find a girl. Okay? I, the, the second dude, of, uh, or, uh, Doug uh, Imhoff, I, I, I'm pretty sure Imhoff. his family's from here. I, mean, I don't know, but I think I think I think that's the case. I don't give a shit, by the way. Just so you, just so you know, if you, you the one definition, you're an American. And fuck where you come from, but that, that or how long you've been here. But it's just how vapid and stupid their arguments are, and it's what colossally dishonest people they are. J.D. Vance is could be the most dishonest person in America. There's Everything about him screams phoniness, opportunism, you name it. Maybe the only honest thing he ever done in his life is marry his wife, of which he can't even talk about because he's part of a cabal of people that pry on that kind of jackass shit. 
Well, it would be fun to be a fly on the wall in Mar-a-Lago right Ooh, now because, you know, you know, he's going he ballistic. He ain't happy and, with look, Tucker uh, and Don Jr. And what did y'all do this to me? Oh, Lord. what the hell did you guys do oh, to me? You know that. And James, we're going to talk with, uh, you know, one of our great guests, Jim, Jim Gerstein, uh, about the problems that Democrats have. But I got to tell you, Donald Trump's life is not very happy right now. No, today. no. And, and you know what? I have to tell you, I, I take unbelievable pleasure in his misery. I, I fantasize about how he's throwing shit at walls and ketchups and plates and screaming at Don Jr. and screaming at everybody. And it makes me feel so good. It's, it's, it's a certain amount of peace that I get. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that. Okay, okay. The the the, the saga, the, the ghost of Mar-a-Lago in the weeks ahead. Right here it comes. Yeah, he's right. mad. Uh, I, well, Elon Musk isn't going to spend the forty-five million that he said he was going to spend each month. Uh, and some of we'll see what some of some of the fat cats who were making those huge promises uh, weeks ago thought it was a slam dunk election. You know, maybe if it looks like Trump's going to win, they'll come back. But money's not going to be a factor in this race. They're both going to have so goddamn much money that, uh, you know, Elon Musk can, uh, you know, spend his money on some other perverted cause. So my favorite is, is the whole cabal. Trump, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, J.D. Vance. And it's all a giant con. And it's not that they just conned you. They're conning each other. Understand, at the end of the day, all a con man has is other con men. Right. And, 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 and actually, Trump actually believed all that shit. All right? Yeah, you got to be, like, kidding me. And... You know, there's speculation, don't know, that, that Peter Thiel was part of a company called Ambrosia, that they were interjecting old people like him with blood or young people. And, you know, by roughly that, I, I, I don't know, but I, I'm sure people are looking into this. It's all one giant scam. And the reason one of my favorite people in American history is P.T. Barnum, because he was the, an honest scammer, a good one. But <laughs> these, all these people, like, believe each other. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, why would you believe anything that Donald Trump ever told you about anything? And Donald Trump actually believed that Elon Musk was going to give him $45 million a month, which I kind of like. Never thought I didn't think no Elon Musk I anyway, mean, but I think Walter wrote a book on him. But it's But don't forget, this. James, he's got that billion dollars coming in from the oil guys who he told in Mar a Lago, you can write your own bill if you give me a billion dollars. Right. So of course. Maybe that'll compensate. It'll, it'll all compensate. And they're they're making money off of you know, the the, the shirts with the you know, patch on his ear. <laughs> Well, we'll see where that goes, but it's it's, it's just a it, it's just kind of delightful to watch scammers scam each other, con men con each other, dishonest people being dishonest with each other. It's all the same shit. And it's been that way in the genuine fools in this world, and then and some of my friends of mine that actually said Trump's a change man. That we're going to see a change oh person God. at the convention. Oh my God! I can't. I mean, I still like Van Jones. I like Dan Abrams. How could you be such a fool? Jesus Christ! How could you be such a fucking fool? The one thing I can guarantee everyone: there may not be any certainties in politics or life. That that Donald Trump is who he is, and he will never be any different. That is a guarantee. And that, is an ugly guarantee. Well, okay, they, we'll at, be at, back. At least with, he's honest. We'll be back with more of this. <laughs> at least he's honest. <laughs> yeah.
beat the heat with miracle sheets. Ooh, you kidding me? You asking me in South Louisiana <laughs> or anywhere else in the country now? Guess what? We're all together in this. <laughs> it's hot everywhere. <laughs> and I have more experience than you do. And sleeping on cool sheets is going to get you a good night's sleep. Yeah, sleeping at the right temperature, it's a critical way to feel rested the next day. Now, if you wake up too hot or too cold, we highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Miracle Made sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver infused thermoregulating fabrics so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long, no matter what the weather is like outside. Plus, the silver lining prevents 99.7% of bacterial growth which means Miracle Sheets require three times less laundry because they stay clean and fresh three times longer. Your bed will feel freshly made every night. Stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores and cause breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle instead. Trust us, with no more gross odors, life is a whole lot better for your household. The NASA-inspired, temperature-regulating, silver-infused fabrics truly give you maximum comfort in any weather. And they make pillowcases and comforters, too. Join us in getting better sleep every night. Not only are Miracle Sheets luxuriously comfortable, they don't have the high price tag of other luxury brands. Miracle Sheets feel nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. So it's a vacation every time you get into bed. You can picture yourself in Bermuda or the islands. It's your call. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo warroom at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product that it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom to treat yourself. So thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Look for the link in our show notes. You know, James Gerstein is one of America's great pollsters with many Democratic clients, and he's also done extensive surveys in Israel. He is also one of our very favorite guests. Jim, a week ago, I, I'm confident you were pretty pessimistic about Democrats in 2024. Still feel that way today? I think we're in a new world, and it's uh, great to see you both. The you know we went from probably three of the worst weeks that Democrats have had in terms of media coverage and political environment in a long, long time, and uh, in a split second it changed. So yeah, I am in a very good mood and um, much better spirits than I was uh, when I spoke with you a week ago. I always like it when Gerstein is in good spirits. That's better for us all. Uh, look, Kamala Harris is off to a great start. Political support, money flowing in, good speech. Uh, but but that's the start. I mean, things are going to get rough. Uh, and what does she have to do and be prepared for just in the next 25 days before the Democratic convention, Jim? Yeah, look, I think it's obviously really important for her to reintroduce herself to the public. Going into this, she had some pretty low favorable favorable ratings, uh, and that was you know that was a big concern for a lot of people uh, throughout this whole period leading up to Biden stepping down. But the big difference between her and Biden is that voters will give her a second look, and they will give her a chance because. As, as James has said on the show a lot, they did not want a Biden-Trump choice. America did not want that. And they were open to something new, and they are very eager, I think, to hear what she has to say. And she has a huge opportunity to demonstrate the kind of 
uh, candidate and president that she would be. So what does she have to do? First, she has to obviously do things that inspire confidence in her uh, as somebody who could lead the country. I think that it'll be critical for her over the course of the campaign to demonstrate um, uh, an ease and a knowledge and understanding of, of the economic situation, uh, particularly the cost of living that's facing people and how things will be different if she's the president. Uh, there, She also needs to do similar work on the issue of immigration so that she is seen as credible on border security. Uh, I think both of those things are very doable, very achievable, and ultimately then we want this from an issue perspective to uh, to be a focus on abortion rights and, because that is an area. And, and the short, I'm going to get back to that because no one's understood that issue better than you have, Jim Gerstein. But in the short run, the next 25 days, it's really a incredible race to define her between Kamala setting the narrative or Trump setting the narrative because that's what it's going to be about. Absolutely, and we are you know. We are have the potential for a very good few weeks right now. The press is clearly excited about covering a uh, a Harris Trump race. I think that the Republicans were strikingly caught flat footed on this. They seem to be flailing around right now. They'll get their footing, and they will, the attacks will come. and And they have a lot of ammunition uh, from you know previous video coverage of her and, and things that she said that they will use uh, to effectively against her. But right now they are flailing around. So we have an opportunity right now, I think, to take advantage of the favorable political environment, the the fact that we're the party that is making a change in the, in the top of the ticket and giving people something new to look at. And We'll have a very good convention. I think that it'll be an opportunity for her to really shine there. Well, Jim, before that, one of the defining choices she's going to have to make is her running mate in the next couple of weeks. A lot of options out there, a lot of people floating around. Do you have any sense, first of all, what you would hope she would achieve with that? And do one or two stand out to you right now? Sure. I, I think the first piece of vice presidential selections is, is kind of do no harm. And we, yeah, we've most of the time the presidential candidate achieves that. Maybe not in the case of Sarah Palin, but most of the time it's a a do no harm pick. Here, I think it may be a little different because this is uh, everything's in turmoil. This is going to be seen as you know her first big decision. I think there's a lot of good folks to choose from. Uh, I think the governors are that are named are really good. Uh, they come with the advantage of not having to fill a Senate seat if we take a senator um, and have a Senate special election in a year or two when things could be very different, especially if we have the the majority uh, and yet that backlash, uh, or if we win the presidency and you have that backlash. So, um, but I think it's, you know, does she pick somebody who is a great speaker and will be out on the trail doing a great job for 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 the case and prosecuting the case as well as um, showing that this is a new, you know, a new ticket, a new direction, kind of the way you had a Clinton Gore, young, fresh, two new people. Uh, or do you go with somebody who is a uh, swing state governor? I mean, you can also get the new piece out of that, but a swing state governor who's popular. I, I think either way, you got a good you got good options, and it's it's a it's going to be hard to see her picking somebody that does harm. James, so so Jim, it's only Jim. It's hard to believe. What, what, what Wednesday today, <laughs> and this was Sunday. This happened. Okay, so in between that, you had Monday and Tuesday. It seems like it was six years ago. All right, have you seen anything in Poland? Either some maybe something y'all have done. You know. You already had schedule or something you've seen publicly that gives you any any sense or any is there any conclusion early conclusion that we can draw or what should we be looking at? Sure, and I think there's a few indicators. One is polling. One is obviously just the fundraising and the enthusiasm that came right. out of that. that and yeah, you know, the voter registration reports of higher voter registration. I, I can say that yeah, we've got we certainly have a lot of polls in the field right now, right. and 
James, okay. you taught me to be very cautious on partial data. Uh, but right, the, but, but, but I, I was like, be cautious, but tell me what the fuck it is. I, I, I distinctly remember the Caution phone calls, to the yes. wind right now, James. Yeah, right, right. I, I think it's fair to say that there's going to be, you're going to see an increase in Democratic voter enthusiasm. And that is, it, it's no small thing because no. we have had a big gap in enthusiasm and motivation to vote with Republicans for quite some time. And Quite honestly, that was a huge concern for Democratic strategists as it related to how were our down ballot races going to do in a situation Absolutely. where motivation was so low. Because we always had this gap between how Biden's performance and Senate candidate performance. So this is a this is the, the motivation for one is going to be I, I think it's safe to say you're gonna, we're going to see a good bump in that uh, in terms of the he, the horse race. I think it's going to vary from state to state. Um Obviously, she's going to get a bump. Uh, there's just a you know that enthusiasm alone is gonna is gonna produce something. But I think uh, the way I'm looking at it is we went from a situation in which we were losing pretty pretty clearly, pretty yeah, you know, uh, in the swing states pretty decisively, where we're going to be in a situation where either the bump will get us to back to the evenly divided country that we're in in a very close race, or even maybe she'll get a in some places, maybe a slightly bigger bump where you'll see uh, uh, us pulling pulling ahead. But it's it's no matter what, there's going to be a, it, it's an issue of how big the bump is. I expect it to vary right. from place to place. So let's talk about the Middle East. In literally, the passions were just running really high. Everybody was into it. You know, you had different views. And it strikes me that Netanyahu came to Washington and honestly, no one gives a shit. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 you, if this would have been three weeks ago, uh, there would have been wall to wall coverage, commentary. And it, it, you know, I don't say this with any sense of satisfaction. I don't know if it's a good thing or, or, or anything like that. But, uh, uh it, it looks like the, the whole Middle East stuff is kind of, it, it had fallen off the radar in the Middle East. Don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. But in the U.S. conscience, it seems to have kind of dissipated a little bit. Is, is, that, is that the same conclusion you have? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I'd say uh, Netanyahu, this, was a pol- this speech was a political stunt from the very beginning, uh, initiated by Mike Johnson and, and team. Right, right. But, but, I, but the timing of it could not have turned out to be any worse for Netanyahu. <laughs> you know? Right, that's all I'm saying. Is, and they thought this was going to show a divided Democratic Party and a United Republican Party. It actually, from their vantage point, it seemed like it could be successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, look, for voters, I'd say that the war in, uh, between Israel and Hamas and, and all the the devastation that people are seeing in Gaza right now, it, it has it has bothered people for sure. It upset they uh, Americans have a lot of sympathy for both the Israelis and the Palestinians. We've seen that in, in polling, yeah, but yeah, right. but in terms of an issue that's driving their what what, what is driving Americans day to day, this is not does not rise to that level. Certainly, as time goes on. Right, it, it it it. But I'm just I'm turning back to out. The, the Israeli diplomacy has got to understand where they are, right? And they're not on the front runner right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly they're on the front runner at, at, on the ground and everything else. But but here, it was an issue with real power. Now it's. It's hard to get people to talk about it, they, and, but you know it goes on. So yeah, we'll see where it goes. I, I would not underestimate uh, Netanyahu's inability to appreciate that point, <laughs> and that, <laughs> that they are not the center. That they are not the center uh-uh. of the universe. Um, a, wa- and, a wise man once said, "When you're trying to keep your ass out of jail, you tend to not appreciate other points." <laughs> Actually, it was me that said it. But I don't give a fuck. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Go well, ahead. You know, I think illustrative of what you both have just said. Netanyahu's biggest attack uh, on uh, on people in this country was not on Biden or on Harris or even the member various members of Congress. It was on the presidents of Harvard and Penn. Uh, Bibi, I hate to tell you, seven months ago, 
they were ousted. They're gone. They're history. They're yesterday. But <laughs> Al, it, it's it's as if he's working off of the the RNC talking points. I mean, yeah, you know, that they it, it, it's it's just bizarre to see a prime minister of another country doing that, let alone an ally of ours. Well, you know, that's exactly what he is. Let me go back. I mean, you know, he just talks. He he clearly wants Trump, but he's got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Now he knows that uh, if he if he. You know, conveys that too strongly, he could come back to haunt him. Well, he clearly wants Trump. He clearly wants to stay out of jail, as James just suggested. <laughs> That's the main thing he wants to do. Um, they have that in common. Yes, ex- they do. Yeah. They, you know, it's a real bond. Uh, I, I want to go back to a couple of political. I want to ask you one question. It's it's a sensitive question. I was with a very very smart uh, you know pal last night, and he said, "Who would you pick?" And I said, I'm not very good at this, but if I would pick anyone, it would probably be Josh Shapiro. And and not just for Pennsylvania, it would help there, but he's really a capable governor and a guy, people say it's a shark. And he said, well, I like that, but let me ask you this. Do you think there would be any problem if you take Doug M. Hoff and Josh Shapiro and his wife of having three Jews uh, in, that, in that foursome? And I said, I hope not. <laughs> I didn't say I think not because it hadn't occurred to me really, but I hope not. What do you think? I, I think you're thinking like a Jewish grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too. I, the, the, they're the ones that are worried about that's the, right. the dangers of things like that. Um, I, I, like, I think that uh, this is going to be about Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Right. And um, I think that, uh, yeah, the, America has shown that it is ready to have all kinds of different people at the top of the ticket and in the in 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 the presidency. And I, that would not that would I don't think that would be a concern or an issue for me. I will say this, the the side, whether it's the, the Democrats or the Republicans, the side that seems to jump on identity politics seems to be the side that does poorly. You know, if if. When the Republicans are the ones talking about DEI hire and all that garbage, they look bad and they look stupid. And when we look like we're the ones about identity politics, we look stupid. I, I think voters, at least in the eyes of the voters, voters want to look at people who are, and what they're going to do for them and how they're going to lead this country. And I think voters are in a very different space than uh, than than those who are looking at this through the, the lens of identity politics. Boy, that's a great point. That really is a great point. Let me ask you one more before turning it back to James. J.D. Vance, a positive or a negative for Trump? Well, I started out by saying a do no harm. I, he, I think the jury's still out on him as to whether he's a do no harm can't pick or not. Um, what I find interesting is how long Trump is going to put up with him. I watched it. You know, I watch Fox News to be aware of what's going on uh, beyond the the media that I normally would consume. And I saw an interview with J.D. Vance and Trump, a joint interview with uh, Jesse Waters from from Fox News. Vance kept interrupting him. It was the strangest thing to me. He, I, it looked like Trump was about to to you know he was seething that this guy who's supposed to just sit there and nod and smile was actually expressing it his opinion in, in interrupting Trump at times. So I, you know, in, in J.D. Vance has not done a good job so far out of the gate. I was so, going to say, that's not I, a career booster. No, and he's, I, but so I don't like, I don't know how much of a difference it's going to make overall to have J.D. Vance on the ticket. Is he going to be Sarah Palin level bad? I doubt it, but Let's see. And I think it'll be interesting to see you know, when, when ads start running that show J.D. Vance referring to Trump as America's Hitler. How, how is Trump? How long is he going to sit sit by on this? I don't know. It, it could be an interesting thing that develops. Well, there was another tape that came out uh, last night, I guess, in 16 of him speculating about how many women Trump had assaulted. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of material there. 26. Yeah. James says 26. <laughs> so, you know, you never think so of James I, no, as no, a the bookkeeper. Rec- the record, but this one, he is a bookkeeper. Right, the, Go ahead, James. The record I got for me. I, so I've just said one thing about J.D. Vance, and there's an expression that is mostly comes from black women, but it, it's not exclusive But in the South. Something may write about that boy. Okay, <laughs> Th- that's what that's what I think about JD Vance. I there's something right about him. There's something I, I think we're gonna, gonna find out a, 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 about it. 
And from the whole perspective of Doug Emhoff or, or whether Josh Shapiro, I don't think there's a person that thinks that Joe Lieberman costs Al Gore 2,500 votes in 2020. I just don't. I, I don't I think agree. there's any evidence that, that, that I mean, it, it, it's interesting. And I know, George, you know, when I remember when they found out that Berkowitz, like the son of Sam, was adopted, every Jewish grandmother said, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> A giant, you know, sigh of relief throughout the country. But uh, at, at any rate, so, so, what are you going to be looking for mostly when you comb through the mountains of data that you see every morning? Are you going to be looking at under 30, uh, black or enthusiasm or male? You know, what's the, in every post and every campaign manager, I always call you more. What, what, what's this number? There's yeah. one number you kind of fixate on. What, what's the number that Jim uh, Gertzing's going to fixate uh, first on? Thing, first thing I look at is independence, especially independent women, uh, because country's so evenly divided. And these are in independence in these swing states are going to where, where the partisan divide is completely down the middle. How which way are they going and how are they moving? So, so, so let me ask you one final question. This is a politics. Define independent for us in Jim Gerstein's mind. What makes how do you get to be an independent? <laughs> well, the first thing is in our surveys, when we ask you if you are a Democrat, right. or Republican or something else, they say I'm an independent. And that that's okay. the first that's but that, the, so self, they, they look so at you say you let them identify right absolutely okay. that that's very important I, and there's a re, you know why I'm doing this but play along with it okay so so then I that you got that test in in about roughly what percent of the, let's just say registered voters are really independent so what what what's the size of the universe we're looking at. Right. It's going to vary from state to state, but ballpark, it's going to be around 8%. Okay. So, so this shit with 32% independence is just insane. Well, right. Well, that's when you don't, that, that's when you don't assign to which Real way they lane. lean. Like, right. yeah, yeah. Because right, right, when if you right, say I'm an right, independent, okay, but right. I lean to the Democrats, guess how you're voting? Right. You're a Democrat. So right. it's very important. It's very important for people to listen to the show to understand what Jim is saying and when people say independents are breaking this way or that way, understand that there are few of them, but they have profound impact. That, okay, that, that's, a, that's the whole point I wanted to make, man. I love having you on the show. I really do. Love these discussions, and I think our, our listeners will, will, will just get so informed about stuff they wouldn't normally do. Uh, let's see where this goes, and I'm sure we'll see you in Chicago. It's going to be a great convention. Well, we're definitely going to see you out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan. James is a huge fan, and my wife is a huge fan. So that's a that's a that's a threesome, Jim Kirstein. Okay. Thank you. It, it is all, all it right. is all mutual, especially when it comes to your wife. So <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Oh, as my daughter used to say, what Jew is calling you now on the phone? Of course, she married a Jew. So what's the difference? All right. Good Thank deal. you, Jim. And now for the outrage of the week. Um, you know, James, my old pal Bob Novak was a huge sports fan. He'd usually cheer for the team based on politics. So if Alabama played Michigan, the Prince of Darkness would go for the Crimson Tide, opposed to the deep blue leftish Michigan. I, I used to make fun of that, but you know, I, I see a little appeal today. Let me tell you why. LeBron James, an avowed Democrat, though he sat out the 2022 midterms, I suspect he's going to be out there for Kamala Harris. He has been a fabulous basketball player for more than two decades. Now, J.D. Vance, the Republican vice presidential candidate and a fellow native Buckeye, has called James, quote, one of the most vile, end quote, people in America. By contrast, I'm certain J.D. follows the dictates of his boss, the Donald, and so he'd much prefer the faux athlete who introduced the presidential nominee in Milwaukee, Hulk Hogan, of WWE fame or infamy. Uh, 
Now, Hogan has been colored by racism charges. When caught using the N-word, he said it was common when he was growing up. He was the center of an infamous controversy over his sex tape that he must have made with a colleague's wife. But most of all, his sport, professional wrestling, is a fake. There is nothing fake about James, who is a good citizen and is anything but a fake professionally. He's actually rivaling Michael Jordan for the title of GOAT, the greatest of all times. So tomorrow in Paris, when James, as the chosen male flag bearer, leads the American athletes on the Seine River to open the 2024 Olympics, it's his fourth time representing the country, just ask J.D. Vance who he thinks best represents his values, LeBron James or Hulk Hogan? (laughs) <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but thank you for putting it that way. In, in I got to tell you, I, I think I was with, with you in, in the, what the hell, MCI, I don't know what the fuck they call it now, and, and saw LeBron James play in high school. Yeah, yeah. And this guy is 39 years old. I've obviously seen him play a bunch of times because he comes to New Orleans a couple of times every year. And I, I don't know... Of a battle, I mean, maybe I could be you know, my Michael Jordan. I bet they're not going to get into an argument about the goat. Or I, you know, I still think that Kareem deserves to be he in does. that conversation. But that's just because he's my my generation. But I, I don't think if you take a combination of a person's athletic skill, work ethic, kind of commitment to to things, if you know, putting money up where, where it really counts to help people, obviously being a good parent to, to that, that son, that Bronny, the young man he has. I, I think LeBron James is one of the most admirable people, how do you say it, of this century? Yeah, I think LeBron James is in many ways one of the most admirable people in this century by it. That not just by his athletic excellence, which is something beyond excellence, but just the way that he's conducted himself and conducted his life and conducted his business and just the whole package of LeBron James. I'm crazy about the guy. I think he's great. Um, you know, my outrage is, is not really an outrage. I, I just want to use this to make a point. If, if you do a complicated math problem, but you get the first calculation wrong, I don't care who you are or how smart you are. You can never get the right answer. And I was watching, you know, kind of liberal-leaning television last night, and I was watching a lot of commentators and reading a lot of comments, and I've been spending time. And if you don't understand what happened this Sunday through today, you're not going to get it right. This was a country that wanted something different. They told us a thousand different ways a thousand different times, and we gave them something different, and there was this giant, not just sigh of relief, this kind of burst of enthusiasm. This is not about a policy. This is really not about a gender or a race. I mean, that's fine. It's, it, I like that people... Are, Become to the point where they, they, they allow, they're allowing themselves to feel this. But but what this the vice president represents is something different, and it's not just that she's different looking or different background or anything like that. Is you're different from them, and just understand that as you make calculations moving forward, because I see too many false assumptions about what's happening, what's going on in the country. And by way of all the things that you want to change and all the things I want to change and all of the the common vision we have, you can't do shit unless you win the election. That's your only fucking job, all right? Your job is not to promote this, not to promote that, not to talk about this. Just win. Then after you win... It's time to deal with the other stuff. But understand why you're there is because you're not Joe Biden and you're not Donald Trump. And you're not there because of who you are. You're there because what you're not. 
And then you can build on that. I'm fine with that. And you can introduce yourself to people. But at this moment, if you don't understand that, you're going to make a mistake going forward. That's my general point. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Hey, James, now for our listener questions. Boy, they are flowing in. People are interested, they're engaged, uh, and they're really with it. We got a lot. Tough to pick which ones, but but I'll make a stab. We'll start off with John in City Island, New York, who says, in order to lose, millions of Democrats need to stay away from the polls. Why do some of the nattering Beltway class think they will? Well, I'm not staying away from any yeah. polls. Yeah, I, John's premise may be wrong. Why, 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 why? I mean, I like it. great. I'm glad you're listening to the show. But tell me why I need to stay away from the Pope. I think he's worried that other quite, Democrats will, not you so much, James. And I think that probably was a pre-last Sunday announcement uh, uh, sort of a question would be my guess. Well, I think a lot of Democrats are, are, are frightened about the future of the country or, or justifiably mortified that there would be, that Donald Trump could be there. And they were, quite honestly, patriotic people in seeing this. And because they did, and they were heard in a thousand different ways, President Biden arrived at, at a wise decision. But, but again, I don't want to I love all our viewers. I love this guy, but I have no uh, no reason why anybody, if they want to look at polls, look at polls all you want to look yeah. at. Yeah, and you'll find that they're in it to a sense they're generally pretty good. The cumulative, they're a little better than pretty good, but things change. But uh, no, I don't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to stop working at polls, and neither should yeah. you. Yeah, no, I agree. But we're having a post on the goddamn right. show, so we and, 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 fuck we can be. And we know polls. John's going to come out. Um, Right. Brooks in Manhattan Beach, California, ask, ask if oh, okay. I think Trump's selection of Vance as his VP might increase turnout in Ohio enough to create a horse race for the other Senate seat. I really don't, uh, uh, Brooks. Uh, first of all, I think that Vance's popularity in Ohio is greatly exaggerated. He won as a it's a red state now. He won last time against a pretty good Democratic candidate, but he ran 10 points behind the governor. Governor Mike DeWine ran 10 points ahead of him. I don't think Vance has, is, is hugely popular out there. Uh, and the other Senate seat is held by Sherrod Brown. And I'll tell you, if you're in a political foxhole, man, I don't know who else you'd want in there with you other than Sherrod Brown. He is tough. He relates to some of those people in places like Steubenville. And my money still would be on Sherrod Brown. So... A, a reliable person told me today, but, but somebody could check this out, that Vance's favorabilities are is six points underwater, which is kind of unusual in, at, right after you get picked. In Ohio or, or nationally, James? It, na yep. Nationally, yep. nationally. And, and he, by the way, Tim Ryan ran against him. He didn't beat Tim, but you know, Ohio is huge. He, he severely mm -hmm. underperformed. And it felt like we all thought Tim had a chance for it. He's a good friend of mine. We were all excited. But he didn't do that great. He's not that popular in Ohio. I mean, DeWine is way more popular than he is. Uh, and, you know, I mean, Sherwood's, he's ahead, okay? Sherwood's, I don't know if it's it, it going to be ahead on election day or what's going to happen. But right now, he's freaking ahead, and they got some disaster for a candidate. I mean, they can pick some balloons. Ohio. And never, ever, ever forget this. The largest corruption scandal in American politics didn't come out of Louisiana or New Jersey or anything that people, it came out of Ohio. Yes. And it was 50 million or whatever it was. It was billions of that nuclear power thing. It's the corruption there is beyond state. And, and James, I think one ex-Republican speaker is in the slammer and the other one, other one may be headed there. Yeah, some guy there, I think his name is Holdhouse. I think he's a guest of the federal government for a while. The rates are good. Uh, Tom mm -hmm. in San Diego 
this is for you, James. Uh, uh, give Tom some insight into who Susie Wiles is uh, and her campaign strategy for Trump. Wow, what a question. First of all, I, I got to tell you, San Diego is one of my oh, favorite places. It is great. And when I went out there, North San Diego County, but not, the, the, everybody found out about my secret place. So. <laughs> they had a, 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 a GOP convention there 28 years ago. It was oh, one of the best conventions I've oh, ever been 96, to. 96. Manageable, ever. easy, great ever. restaurants, nice people, beautiful weather. Yeah, right, all oh, right there. Wow. Gaslight District. And now they got that stadium in downtown. Yep. I, 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 I love yep. San Diego. I, I just, if, if I didn't live in Louisiana, I'd live in uh, uh, Del Mar, Encinitas, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, it, it, so Susie Wiles, first of all, her dad is somebody that you and I are very familiar with, and some of our demographic would be Pat Summerall, who was a very talented sports broadcast. I don't think anybody would like deny that. And she kind of grew up in Florida, Republican politics was apparently extremely effective. And I think it's fair to say that she made Ron DeSantis. And, you know, she understands that the whole world of Florida Republican politics, uh, which I know never tried to, but there was, obviously she was very, very good at it. And for reasons that I don't know, and I'll ask my friend Nikki Freed, maybe she can explain it to me, Mrs. DeSantis decided she didn't want her around anymore. And by all accounts, Miss Susie Wiles didn't take very kindly to her being deposed and immediately ended up in Mar-a-Lago. And all of the stories about him eating pudding with his fingers and state airplane use and all that, there's... There's no doubt that that came from Susie Rouse. And I know this, every big time reporter you ever heard of has got her cell phone number in, in contact all the time. I mean, she were great leakers. Uh, you know, I say just in not, not anything other than a, in a sort of admiring professional way. What I am a little bit, and, and she is by all accounts savvy, and this guy, Chris La Civita, was supposedly the coordinator behind the swift boat attacks. He's got not a reputation that I'd necessarily want, but, but he does have a reputation of being pretty confident. And there was this entire body of thought that Trump was still going to be Trump. Okay, that's not going to change. But he had some, some talent. Uh, you know, that we're doing his campaign, that we're doing his strategy, is evidenced by what happened to DeSantis and the party. What the fuck were they doing when they got caught off guard by Biden pulling out? I, that's a story that I really want to read. Because I mean, this is not like Roger Stone or, or, you know, the kind of general clowns they have around them. These people have some political experience in some political seasoning, not, not the kind that I would take kindly to, but you got to admit that they did. And I just, I thought they were going to be pretty good and they may still be pretty good, but they, they got, they got caught with a vicious goddamn left hook with their guard down. I can tell you Well, that. you know, if, uh, I, James, you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I mean, certainly they know how to you know, do smear politics. They're very, very good at that. But when you read Tim Alberta, who's been a great reporter on the Trump campaign, and in the Atlantic on Tuesday, I think, or Wednesday, they were just totally ill-prepared. I mean, they'd only right. gone through the motions. That's really malpractice. Um, that, that, that is hard. You know, I mean... I, I, I mean... Yeah. This, I know, it, it, because... But, but we would try to think of contingencies and have a plan to deal with the contingency. I mean, I, you do that in statewide right, races. Right. I don't understand how they said, okay, if this happens, let's break the glass. Here's the five things we're going to do immediately. And it, they clearly didn't have that. And that's a, that's a kind of, that, that's not a very complicated Thing. I mean, campaigns do that. You know, they they anticipate attacks, and they, you know, that they, 
fantasize and about some event that's going to change on you and how you adjust it. But this wasn't a, a, a fantasy that Biden would decide not to run and Harris would be the heir apparent. It was becoming kind of clear, I don't say to most people, but it was, it was not, it was, you know, he might have to drop out. And if he does, you know, and as the TikTok got closer, the more evident it was, it was going to be. They should Harris. have listened to us, James, because that Tuesday, they Wednesday, should've. and Thursday of the convention week, we thought there was at least, we actually thought there was a better than 50-50 chance Biden would drop out. But, you know, agreed there was, it wasn't, a, you know, a slam dunk, right. but it was, you know, maybe at least, uh, you know, a, a slight prob- probability and not to be prepared for that. Well, Ryan and... Right, and, and I, I would describe neither one of us as surprised no, when he dropped out. No, not at all. I wasn't... We go, oh, who could have seen this coming? Actually, a lot of people yeah. saw it coming. Ryan in Medford, Oregon. That's that's really a great town. I've been to that's Medford. I really, it I really, is. I've never been there, but it's in the Willamette it, Valley. Everybody in Oregon it, lives there. It is in. terrific. It used to be a really booming town, went in hard times, and now it's back booming again with a lot of California tech people. Uh, but Ryan asked a very good question. Why hasn't there been a concerted effort by Democrats to draft well-known and respected former military generals such as John Kelly and James Mattis in the speaking out about the dangers of a second Trump term. I I would be shocked if there's not, because it's so natural. They both feel that way. Um, and I, uh, you know, after they pulled, after they had the gold star parents out at the Republican convention, which was a very emotional scene, uh, it, it really was. And Biden made the mistake of saying no one had been lost, no in combat during his presidency and these 13 Afghan, uh, 13 soldiers in Afghanistan had. But after that, you know, I thought, boy, the, the counter is to bring out John Kelly, who will tell you when he was with Trump and tried to get him to go to a, you know, highly uh, celebrated, important uh, uh, Marine cemetery. There are others, but mainly Marine cemetery in Europe that Trump said to him that he thought that fallen soldiers were suckers and losers. There were other generals there too. And Jim Mattis thinks he's unfit to serve. They owe it to the country. They owe it to the country to talk about that. And if Democrats aren't working that hard now, I would be surprised and disappointed. And it goes with a question that, that, that Sharon in Orange County asked, uh, have any of the former Trump confidants and staffs I've uh, been invited to speak at the Democratic Convention. I'm interested in Jim Mattis and John Kelly primarily. So I don't have <coughs> any doubt that there was some effort. It, it, you know, right now with, with the whole, you know, that Trump got hit hard and he wasn't ready for it. I got to think the Harris people, they were already vetting VP candidates before President Biden made his announcement, which kind of makes me like them more. That they, you know, I think they were anticipating the possibility of something like this happening. I think their strategy was great to just be loyal right to the end. And no, no, no issue with any of that. And I, I don't know if they can pull it together between now and the convention. I hope they could. I don't know how far along the convention planning is, or how much this has thrown it off balance. But I don't have any doubt that there's going to be a concerted effort on the part of not just the defense of DOD people, or generals, or admirals, or stuff like that. They're also going to be part of the diplomatic corps, retired, particularly retired diplomats. and. You know, people that serve the Republican Party as ambassadors and foreign policy advisors. That's that's going that that's going to there can be a lot of a lot of push on that. I, I don't have yeah, any doubt. And, I don't know how it takes. And there and there and there should there sure should be. Uh, Seamus in Melbourne, Australia. Let's hear it from down under. Oh, Seamus, this good Says Irish Trump name. is for Russia and against China, and yet China and Russia have a no limits friendship. Why aren't Democrats exploiting the incoherence of Trump's position? Well, I don't know that Trump is for Russia against China. I I think Russia's probably paid him more, but China can rectify that because it's a much wealthier country. Uh, Of course, he's really for Saudi Arabia, if you don't know what he's really for. 
the idea that anything that Donald Trump does is strategic or even has remotely the interest of the United States in it is, is utterly laughable. It just is. And everything about him is about his personal money and his ego. There's nothing else to the man. And of course, the basic elements of the steel dossier, you know, we have this detail right or this detail wrong, but he's totally at the mercy of the Kremlin, and we know that. I don't, I don't need any more evidence than what I got. And, you know, are they going to be involved in our election? Of course, they were involved if they put up Jill Stein in 2016. Or you couldn't get anybody to write it, but it's true. There's no way, it's just undeniable. And it's undeniable that they are going to be involved this time. And, you know, idiots are, are, are going to refuse to believe it. You know, I hope we don't make the same mistake that, you know, people made in 2016, but you never know. Yeah. You never know. James, I'm going to steal this next one from you. It's Diana in Aptos, California. And she says, who in the Democratic camp can repeatedly state clear, concise, brief mottos that can arouse voters? I've never <laughs> understood why Republicans are better at this. I've got one, and I've written it. He ought to be the campaign chairman for Kamala Harris, and that's New Orleans' own Mitch Landrieu. He is as articulate as anyone in politics. He ought to be the campaign chairman and out there, out front, ought to hire some, you know, somebody, I don't know, a, a David Pluff type to run the campaign. But, man, there's no one uh, better on his feet and can articulate uh, what politics is all about today than Mitch Lanchew. I knew, I knew you'd hate it that I stole that from you, James. Right. But, but why not vice president? But why shouldn't he be? I'm, I'm saying that they should be. Why, why wouldn't? Why wouldn't the best communicator, best defender, best attacker in the country, that was a elected lieutenant governor in a red state, was a highly successful mayor, was chairman of the U.S. Conference on Mayors, who was the cabinet member in the Biden administration, and most glorious accomplishment of this administration, maybe any administration, was the infrastructure bill. I think. I have no idea. But. And, you know, and maybe there are other people and other reasons that you want, but uh, why wouldn't he be, in, in by the way, a, a visionary on race relations and inclusion? And I mean, it's nobody freaking better. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I would hope, you know, they should consider him for vice well, president. Well, if they don't, they sure as they the sure as heck should have him out front from uh, you know November nineteenth right. to, or excuse me, uh, August nineteenth to. November uh, 5. All right, James, I took that away, but I'm going to give you an easy one. This is really an easy one. Robin in Gardenville, Nevada. What are the cons mm. of President Biden resigning? Uh, what did Nixon, what did Eisenhower say? He said, what did Nixon give me two do, weeks. Do vice president? He says, give, give me two weeks and I'll think of something. I mean, the, the, the cons are that here's the eight. A, not just a decent man, one of the most accomplished people, uh, you know, maybe in my lifetime. I mean, honestly, if you just if you just put the record right. up, and by every estimation, a, a, a kind of decent, caring guy, but not, and you know, he had a dream, and it's something he wanted, and it, it died. Now, do I feel sorry for somebody that, you know, 30 years of the United States Senate, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, the Judiciary Committee, eight years as vice president and four years as president and, you know, had a whole center at the University of Pennsylvania? I don't feel sorry for him, but I, it does. It, this, at the human level, this was his dream and this is something he wanted. It, he did everything he could, and at the end, you know, wives had decided that it just wasn't possible. So that, I guess that, I don't, no one feels good that this is about him having to do this, but everybody feels good that he ultimately did it. 
All right, listen, you sent in so many great questions this week, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but send them again next week uh, because uh, we love to hear from our listeners. Thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I am Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the link to our sponsor, Miracle Made, in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And check out our Substack at politicswarroom.com. James and I are constantly adding new content, so go take a look. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Remember, please rate the show with a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.